Welcome to my kitchen. Benvenuti alla mia cucina. Today, we're going to make pan fried pork chop with fagioli all'uccelletto. You're gonna make it yourself. I'll show you how. It's so easy. Pasta with pesto. I'll show you step by step how to make the perfect pesto. And my delicious version of poached apple with prosecco and sugar. And I'm going to share with you how jazz music has inspired my version of a very elegant meal. Come for the recipes. Stay for the stories. I would say it's kind of strange, but I have this passion uh, for jazz, and old school jazz, uh, Billy Holiday, Satchmo. Satchmo himself, I think it was one of the most brilliant men ever. Uh, it wasn't until I read later in life about uh, some of the things that he had achieved. Uh, when he escaped the United States and he escaped to Europe because at the time he had an issue with some mobsters in Chicago that were after him, and he found himself on a boat going to Europe and discovering that Europe was far better known that he was in the United States. His records had already hit height, and he saw for the first time the freedom uh, that Europe was offering to the conceptual idea uh, of what race, religion, but more than that, music. <laughs> Fagioli e lucioletto. The pork chops are pan fried, and then we mix them together with fagioli e lucioletto, which is my grandma's recipe. A combination of these two elements brings together a dish the likes of which you've never seen before for its taste, flavor, and simplicity. Let me show you how to make it. This, I have to tell you, is a mistake that most of us make, including myself. Uh, a pork chop is a very lean cut of meat, does not have a lot of interstitial fat. So there is this one little trick that I've learned early in my professional life that really has brought to me enormous satisfaction. And I want to share it with you because this will be the last time you will ever make a pork chop uh, that is not tender. And this little trick is incredible. So let me show you exactly what it is. What we have in here is basic, simple water. Then we have salt and sugar. To the water, what we add is a good amount of salt and a good amount of sugar. And they have to fight against each other in a certain way. And then I like to stir it just like this. We want to get as much of the sugar and the salt completely suspended into the water. In the uh, plastic bag in which I uh, placed the pork chop, we are going to pour this basic marinade. And this is something that you can do at least five hours ahead of time before you plan to do it. If you do it overnight, it's even better. For those of you that really get into it, uh, there are two things that you need to learn. One of it, which is the most important part, is to let the air out so this one can really set flat, and like this I've done it. And now you're gonna place this in the refrigerator, and what I propose, if you're only gonna keep this for five hours, after the two hours, turn it and move it on the other side so that the marination of the water with the sugar and the salt is gonna happen on both sides. Well, I'm gonna place this in the refrigerator and then I will show you how to make my favorite dish, fagioli al lucioletto. That was taught to me by my grandma. The making of fagioli al lucioletto is quite simple. Uh, let's go over the ingredients because the most important part is that we're using cannellini beans right straight out of the can. What we've done, we strain the cannellini beans, but you should know that they're cooked already. So the most important part for us is to make the sauce in which they will braise for picking up the flavor. The making of the sauce is quite simple. Extra virgin olive oil. To this, we add our garlic. To the garlic, we add our chopped onions and you wanna let this stir for just a little while. Now we're cooking on medium heat and there is an importance as to why we do this. We want for these onions to soften. The biggest mistake that most people make is they get overly aggressive with the onions and they go at it with super high heat and you end up burning them. By cooking them on medium, medium low heat, instead they soften a little bit at the time. When we wait for the onions to get to the exact heat that we want, let's add the rest of the ingredients which are quite important for us. 
First I go with a little bit of my rub, my special rub. Together with that, I'm gonna have two type of herbs. I'm gonna have fresh basil and rosemary. This is fresh rosemary from my garden outside, which I chopped up very finely. Now we're going to move everything around and make sure that it picks up this wonderful flavor. We're going to let the garlic to be licked a little bit by the flame and soften up together with the rest of the ingredients. This is the most important part of our cooking because it's at the very base of our sauté. As you can see, the onions are translucent, they're nicely reduced. At this point, what I like to do is to add some chopped tomatoes. These tomatoes are some Marzano tomatoes, which I have drained, chopped up very fine, and now we're adding together to the base, which is the onion and the garlic. This is very typical of my Italian lifestyle, as you've seen before. You've noticed that this time I have not placed to this any red pepper flakes. You can do that if you wanna make it a little bit spicier. But I'm cooking for my wife tonight and she specifically asked me not to make it spicy. But if you do it for yourself and you really don't care about it and you like it spicy, if I was you, I would put them in. They are a fantastic addition. This, I gotta serve it to Nancy. And one thing that I'm always respectful of when it comes to my wife is I only like to do things the way she likes. To this at this point, what I like to add is a little bit of the water uh, that came from the tomatoes during the packing of the tomatoes. When we strained it, I kept the extra water because I want these juices to be part of it. Why? <laughs> you know, that's the question I always ask you, why? If you don't know why you do things and you just do things to do them, and that's an issue. So let's discuss the why as to why all this is taking place. We want to create, in a certain way, a mock of a sauce. In this sauce, we want to braise the cannellini beans, which I have here, which we had drained already. So let's add a few of the cannellini beans in here. The cannellini, as they are, they're already being cooked. And it's this sauce right now that is giving them the flavoring that we want. You see how it's embracing the beans? And it's important that you do drain the beans because the water that they are kept in the can is too salty and it would actually ruin this dish. As a matter of fact, sometimes, depending on the brand that I use, there are some brands out there that, in my opinion, the water that they use to pack the beans is too full of salt. I also wash the beans once I drain them from the can. You be the judge of that, but be alert. Different brands use different techniques on how to do this. We got everything that we need right here in the pan. The last thing that I like to do is to place the cover on it, reduce the heat to medium low, and let this sit on the back of the stove where in the next few minutes we'll finish cooking. While that is taking place, let's make the pork chop. The pork chop is now ready to be cooked. It's marinated for quite a while. The first thing I wanna do though is to actually drain the pork chop and make it nice and dry. So what I like is we put it here a nice little towel and moisten it with some oil so that when it touches the heat it does not stick. And then a little bit of my favorite rub. Onion powder, garlic powder, paprika, salt and pepper in equal parts. Pork chop is ready. Now I'm gonna wash my hands. Let's cook it. All right, the pork chop is ready to go into the hot oil. Now notice what I do. I'm putting it from this side down to this side. And the reason why I do that, if any oil was to splatter, it would splatter out that way. Uh, when you let it go down this way, if it's too aggressively placed, it might splash back at you, and this is a very hot oil. You don't want to do that. Right? Ready to turn the pork chop. Now, we're gonna cook this on this side for two more minutes. A 
little bit of butter. To me, adding butter to the pork chop to do the glazing, it's almost like a religion. It allows me two things, to maintain this wonderful creaminess in the glazing of the pork chop, this beautiful flavor that it picks up, and this beautiful sheen. And also, as it drips down, it cooks all the sides exactly the way I want to. The pork chop is cooked perfectly, so now I'm going to move the pork chop aside. I'm going to pull down the pot with the beans. We're now going to do the last bit of flavoring that the pork chop does need, and it's quite simple. We're going to take it in from the pan. We're going to place it straight into the beans. And now, something that is quite important, you want to make sure that you have enough beans so they come up here all the way down to the top of the pork chop. The soft, gentle braise will really enrich the meat of the pork chop. How long do you want to cook it like this? I would say between four to five minutes and don't do it on medium, medium high. Rather, I like to drop it down to medium low and it's the slow simmer that's going to take the pork chop exactly where we want it to go. The beans are fantastic. They're so soft and creamy. Mamma mia, che bellezza. The pork chop that's cooked through and it's wonderful. Now, let's plate it. Let me show you how to do that. And here's how you make a wonderful dish, a simple dish from my past. And yet, within the context of this cook, and there's all these beautiful juices though from the pork chop that are running right into the beans, feeding these beans with a flavor element of which we had not had before. The rosemary, which is a complete surprise in this particular dish, is almost explosive with flavor, but what is great is the tenderness of this pork chop. After you learn the technique around maintaining this tenderness, you will never have a tough pork chop in your whole life. You don't need to tell them you learned it from me. I just want you to be happy. I want you to be proud. Knowing that you are proud when you make my food for your friends is the greatest compliment I could possibly hope to have. And this is how you make pork chop with fagioli al buccelletto. And the fact that music was this big, great unifier. And there are legends to this very day how much fun it was to be part of that band. It was a band in which magic took place every night. Uh, so, uh, as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest things to me would be if I could get people to see what is that I see. And one of my favorite expressions is when I make pasta is, the pasta and the sauce, they gotta dance together. If they don't dance together, they're two strangers, they meet in the street. They don't even hold hands, they don't even kiss, they got nothing to do. One is the pasta, the other one is the sauce. Who wants that? When I cook the pasta and the sauce together, they dance. And while they dance, we even exchange a kiss. And you, you're the lucky recipient of that. Because when you eat that, there's a soul in that dish that's far more important than the ingredients that you used. Pasta with pesto. Pesto originally is a recipe that comes from the town of Genova, and Genova is not in Sicily. But it's been said that when Sicilians make it, it's even better than what it is in Genova. <laughs> well, I'll show you step by step how to make the perfect pesto for the next get together of your home. Let me show you how to make it. You may wonder, why is it I'm smiling? <laughs> because we're making pesto, and then we're making pasta with pesto. And you know me, I have a love for pasta in general. Pesto especially. I'm sorry to tell you that pesto is not a Sicilian recipe. As a matter of fact, pesto as we make it uh, uh, owes its origin to the town of Genova. They made it quite popular all throughout Italy. We even have a Sicilian kind pesto, but ours is uh, from the town of Trapani. And it's made with pine nuts and tomatoes. It does not find itself relevant within the context of making this. But what I wanted to showcase first and foremost is how simple making pesto is. Let me show you exactly how difficult. Here we go with the first ingredient. This is extra virgin olive oil. We're about, about a third of a cup in here. 
Here are some leaves of basil that I picked up from the garden and we're just gonna stick it right in here. In the old days, my father used to make this with mortar and pestle. This is garlic. Garlic that we have cut nice and thick, it really doesn't matter how you cut it because we're gonna process it almost to a cream-like consistency on the inside here. The next addition that we're going to make, which is the making of uh, the pesto, is pine nuts. Uh, there's a bit of trickery that you can do, uh, toasting the pine nuts ahead of time to open them up with flavor if you wanted to. Sometime I've done it, I don't find a huge difference. So in this particular case, the pine nuts right out of the package are absolutely perfect. And the last addition is Parmesan cheese, but we're going to add it in a short while. Let's take a look and see first how quickly and how fast we're gonna be able to make this happen. Sometime it takes hours. Hours, I tell you. Now, when you get to this point, you need to have a couple of tools that help you uh, and help you significantly in pushing this down like this to make sure that the blade completely gets it. And then there is the marriage of the Parmesan cheese. It cannot be pecorino. In spite of the fact that I love pecorino, you know how much I love it, Parmesan cheese is first and foremost at the very base of all this. So what I do, I push it down like this, but for you to really get what you want, you also need to add a little bit more of extra virgin olive oil. The way I see it, this pesto is ready to rumble. And let me show you exactly how to make pasta with pesto. Pasta con pesto! It's fun, isn't it? I go around every day saying pasta con pesto, pesto, pasta, pasta con pesto. It's so much fun. This pasta, by the way, believe it or not, comes from the state of Oklahoma. It's a friend of mine. His name is Chris. Crazy, man. Transferred over there because he fell in love with a girl from Oklahoma. Beautiful state, by the way. Been there several times myself. And he makes this pasta according to the Italian tradition. And it's excellent. Uh, this particular pasta that we have, uh, in this particular case that we are using, uh, those are short rigatoni, very typical of the south of Italy. So I'm using a southern pasta uh, for the making of pesto. In this spot, what I have is some butter. Why? It gives the pasta a wonderful texture, is an added element of flavor that usually is not commonly done. The reason why I choose butter is because butter is wonderful. Now, very gently, let's make sure we don't overdo this. Here we are. Now, the pasta is in the butter, and at this point, what I want to do is turn it around continuously. And the reason why we keep stirring it about is because we don't want for the pasta to stick there. And there you are. Pasta is starting to pick up a little bit of the toasting. That's exactly what we want. Che bellezza, che bellezza. Now, the moment has come for us to really do what we're supposed to do. I turn off the heat altogether. There is no further heat coming from underneath this pot. And this is very important. And what we're going to do at this point, it's right here. I'm gonna add a little bit of the pesto. And here we are. Now we're dressing the pasta with the pesto. You see the beautiful color that it picks up? The pesto is not breaking down. There is enough heat left in the pasta that is allowing for the pesto to basically stick to the outside of the pasta. As it stands here, you see it all perfectly colored. We have enough pesto to put some on top of the pasta, but you see no huge division. And the last thing that I do to bring everything together and taking advantage of this is adding a bit of Parmesan cheese to make this even more interesting. And here we go. Ah. Mamma mia, che bellezza. And this is really how you make pasta with pesto. Now, there is one last step, and that is the step on how to plate it, which is the most important one. Let me show you how to do that. Ah, guarda che bellezza sta pasta. È la fine del mondo. 
in Italy, every time we get excited, they say, this is so good, it's like the end of the world. I'm not so sure that the end of the world is such a good thing, but this is what I call a portal. Every time I see this pasta, almost by magic, I am taken into a time machine back to my youth as a child in my home in Palermo. And uh, my joy is to share this uh, information, this joy, this technique with everybody who's willing to listen. Because this pasta is not just a pasta. This pasta is a work of art. And this, this is how you make pasta al pesto. I find myself taken to a place of dream, and I don't know why is it the jazz does that to me. I mean, I wasn't brought up with it. It was not part of what I listened when I was a kid. But somehow, when I heard jazz for the first time, the articulation of the sound, this uh, complete improvisational style, as well as a well-managed style of connecting this improvisation into a form of art that suddenly carries you, your soul, your mind, your body, into an element of extreme happiness. It's something that works for me. And the poetry of the music and the song, the words of the songs that go with it. Poached apple in Prosecco wine and sugar. Prosecco is an Italian wine with a little bit of bubble to it. And this is a dessert that's very easy to make and yet is full of flavor. Let me show you how to make it. On medium heat, uh, which is the amount of heat that you don't want to go beyond, we're gonna add to the pan a little bit of uh, Prosecco, sparkling wine. Prosecco is not a brand, it's a type of wine. Together with the sparkling wine as we have it in here, we're going to add a little bit of apple juice. The apple juice brings out the sweetness, uh, and the sweetness and a certain complete balance to it because it's apple on apple at that point. But the thing that's just as important, if not more important, is the sugar. And the sugar is in quite large quantities. Uh, for you to keep it as a rule of thumb, the amount of sugar that we're using is the same amount in terms of volume of the amount of wine that we have placed in this. So what we're going to do at this point of a medium, medium high heat, we're going to bring this to a boil. Before this even reaches a boil, what I want to do is to actually take the apples and place them in. Doesn't matter which way or which side you do. What's going to happen in here is over an elongated period of time, the liquids will start to reduce. And the reason why you see me stirring continuously is that I want to avoid for the sugar to burn at the bottom of the pan. All right. We're about 10 minutes into this. We have another 20 minutes. What I like to do at this point is to compress the heat. And what I do is I reduce this down to medium low and I'm going to force the caramelization of this. I'm gonna keep an eye on it every five minutes. It's been poaching now for a little bit over 30 minutes, 33, 35 almost. Uh, the caramel has really gotten to the dark color that I want. I've been very attentive, stirring continuously to make sure that nothing uh, sticks to the bottom. Every five minutes you gotta do that. Let me take off the cover so you understand. Mamma mia, look at that, che bellezza! The apples at this point are completely cooked, so what I like to do is to transfer the apples out of the process, like this, excellent. And I'm using a slotted spoon to do it. Then, one last thing that I want to do to the caramel at this point, to add about a tablespoon of cream. And the cream is going to give a texture to the sauce that really makes the wonderful caramel. You see how much it's darkened already? Mamma mia, get bellets. This is absolutely gorgeous. All right, the sauce is ready. The apples are ready. Let me show you how to plate it. The most beautiful thing about this plate is the simplicity of the ingredients. But the taste is the most uh, incredible thing. These apples are so soft, it's like biting into cream. 
The last thing is taking advantage of this wonderful sauce that we made is to drizzle it right on top of it. What I like is to sprinkle with a little bit of pistachios. Having a dessert, enjoying life like this tells you that you're a kid again. I don't care if you're 50, 60, 70, 80s, 90s, 100. Desserts like this, they bring the child in all of us. And this is how you make po chapo with prosecco and sugar. Billie Holiday, to this day, is to me one of the most astonishing performers I have ever had the opportunity to listen to. I never witnessed uh, live, you know, she was long gone by the time I came to know of her. But there's something about the soulfulness of jazz that I think is perfectly connected to what happens in the kitchen. Because it's a continuous exercise in improvising and understanding the elements of what you have before you that might all go together. But somehow you find the line in the middle and you carry it through. Even a plate of pasta can become a perfect jazz concert. And I'm going to share with you how jazz music has infected, infected. <laughs> 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 Infected. Who came up with that? <laughs> All right. Thanks, nice Boomba. Yeah. Loving it. Ready? Coming your way. Oh.